stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker at Elkins Consulting. In my work with coaching clients, I guide people to improve their communication using storytelling as the foundation of our work together. What I've realized over years of coaching and podcasting is that the majority of people don't realize the impact of the stories they share on their internal messages and on the people they're sharing them with. What really lights me up is guiding executives and uncovering the stories in their lives that are meaningful. The stories that, when shared with the right audience in the right way, connect, inspire, and motivate. Here's what a former client had to say about our work together. As a leader of leaders, I struggle with how and when to use my stories to emphasize the points my audience is looking for. It's a delicate balance between sounding like I'm bragging and delivering a message that needs to be heard. Sarah's approach to storytelling clears that obstacle so that you can deliver a clear and concise message using your stories to emphasize your points. It's truly amazing when it all comes together. Greg McDonough, Blackburn Capital Advisors and President of the Entrepreneurs Organization of Washington, DC. Visit elkinsconsulting.com to learn more about working with me. Well, today is a special treat for me. Uh, Tom Dietzler and I have been friends for a couple years, three years now, four years, something like that. And um, he reached out to me years ago and asked me to coach him in his writing. And uh, we've been friends ever since. There's been not a gap in more than a month that we haven't talked to each other or connected with each other. And so I'm just grateful Tom was able to fit me into a schedule to record a podcast episode where your stories don't define you how you tell them well. Thanks for joining me, Tom. It's great to be here, Sarah. Uh, I'm kind of honored and touched by this. I've always been a fan of yours. And so this is a special treat for me. I love it. I love it. Well, and we can talk a little bit about our work together because I think um, the podcast listeners might be interested in it because a lot of what we did together is kind of what I do when I'm interviewing people for my podcast. So, (laughs) but as you know, if you listen to my podcast, I would love to start this conversation with a question for you. Um, Would you please share something about yourself that most people might not know about you? Something that would give our listeners a little more perspective um, before we get into our conversation. I guess I'd have to go with, and, you know, this may fall in the category of humble bragging, but it's just something I've noticed in that from going back to my, even to my high school days and beyond that, I've kind of always had a way of falling into leadership positions in different organizations that I've been into. It's nothing that I really ever saw it. And if people thought, Oh, here's a guy we can, we can stick with the chairman's position. And um, I've, I've been that in a number of different organizations and in things that I've done. And um, it's helped me to learn and grow to be in the part of not always being a strong advocate for one thing or the other, you know, trying to seek really learning to listen to people because they're coming at you from all different sides with all different perspectives. And, but for whatever reason, yeah, I end up, I end up with the gavel a lot and um, I hope I've done well in those positions, but I, I know it's been a great benefit to me and I'm thankful for it. Well, of course, I'm drawn immediately to your time as a, um, a host for and, <laughs> and chaperone for your kids' marching band and those years of doing that and taking on that leadership role. And um, what else? Can you tell me another scenario where that happened? Um, well, I, you know, I really didn't have a, a set group of people that I hung around with. I think you remember the story I told about how I changed friends in high school. <laughs> mm-hmm. I share that story a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah. And then in that was my junior year. And, and then senior year, I was approached to, to run for senior class president. And I said, why? And and they just thought I was the because I didn't I wasn't part of a clique. So I guess that made me appealing. So that happened to me. Um, uh, in college, I became the editor of um, the co-editor of our student newspaper. I was the uh, the chairman of the of the the theater and drama group that I was a part of, um, starting around 2004-ish for a number of years. Um, I was chairman of our board of education. 
um, at the school and church we belong to. And then um, I've served multiple stints. I think three different times I was um, chairman of the, the church council. So the, the, the basically the president of that organization. Yeah, and then the, the the marching band one was was really came out of left field because I hadn't even traveled with the band at all. I barely knew anything about them. So, yeah. So either people think this guy is a sucker to say yes to pretty much whatever we ask him <laughs> for. They see something in me that you know, whatever. I'm, well, I'm I thankful don't, for I all the experience. That. I don't know about the marching band, but I'm guessing the others just saw that you're pragmatic. Now you have a tendency to sit back and listen to everything before you make your decision. That's and it's um, yeah, it's and, and if I, you can do that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially um, in scenarios where things could get a little tense, and um, everyone wants to be heard. And I think the best leaders are the ones that will take that step back and try not to have a dog in the fight. You know, try to listen to everything before any decisions get made. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the reason I specifically reached out to you was you shared a post this week that was really insightful about um, how, well, I, I won't say what it's about. I'll just say that you told a story of um, uh, listening to a four-part series, a history podcast um, about the Great Chicago Fire of what was what was the year? 1871. 1871, the Great Chicago Fire. And um, what you said in the article was, you know, you told all the background story about the fire and and everything that you could about the the person who was sharing this information on the podcast. And then you said that one of your frustrating moments really was that you kept thinking about the big fire at the same time that was happening in Wisconsin, right? Right, exactly. And yeah. killed more people and burned more acreage, maybe not homes specifically, but mm -hmm. properties for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and you were kind of frustrated that that wasn't mentioned during this episode, uh, during this podcast. And they had four one hour episodes, like, they had plenty of time to, to mention, oh, there's other just, fire was going on at the same say, time. It was like, hey, you know, 250 miles north, there was there was another fire that was bigger and whatever. Never, right. not, not even not even a whisper. So Right. And and what was interesting to me was your take on it was that you wanted to kind of interject about your story, which is the, the story, the book that you had read about this fire at the time. And not far from there, 250 miles north, but back then 250 miles was a great, much greater distance than it is now. So mm -hmm. they were probably totally unaware of it until months and months later. Right. But your take on it was that you weren't listening at first because you were so busy with your own story in your head and, and right. this comparison in your head between the two fires. And, and why wouldn't he mention that there was this other fire so close? And what was your conclusion? I mean, what's it, what was the point of the article? That you, this guy, um, he deconstructs historical events and he researches them and he talks about them. And he, this one, he had chosen the Chicago fire. So that there was another fire going on. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of historical events that were probably going on at that same time that, for whatever reason, he chose not to talk about. So, um, you, you know, I was started out by playing the card of, oh, we're in Wisconsin, everybody overlooks us, you know, we're kind of a, uh, you know, off the beaten path a little bit. And here's Chicago, the big city in the Midwest that gets all the attention. And our fire was a lot worse, but he <laughs> wasn't talking about <laughs> the Peshigo fire in Wisconsin. He was talking about the Chicago fire. Right. So one of the things you said was uh, that you were kind of berating yourself a little for trying to throw in your comparison mm -hmm. for listening for the sake of responding, as opposed to listening for the sake of understanding. Right. And um, I get that to a certain extent. I, I hear where you're coming from because I know you and because <laughs> we've talked a lot about this over the years about um, that urge 
to interject and share our own story when we hear somebody else's story. And over the years, I've come to the conclusion that it's not that you feel like you have to compete or that you have to compare the stories. My impression of the way that you interject your stories is, oh, I, I want to share this story that's related to add more depth and dimension to the conversation, not necessarily right. because my story is better or more right. interesting. Well, yeah, to, because if you can if you can relate to somebody that you you've kind of walked in their shoes or that you you have a certain degree of empathy because you've experienced something similar. I mean, that goes a long way toward uh, a connection toward, you know, to drawing them out more and maybe having them expand upon what they're talking about. But, you know, there are, you know, there's limits to that. (laughs) Mm -hmm, Definitely. And to, to your point, I would say that the majority of people, when they hear a story and they want to interject their own story, they're not necessarily listening to that person's story because they're thinking about which story they could add to it. And right. it depends yeah. on the context. But I would say across the board, that's that's the general way, the general mode. And I think what's important is that we miss this huge opportunity when we do that. Right. I w- it's just funny because I was listening to a podcast you know, it's like, <laughs> Sarah, you're you're very you're wonderful with your listeners because you keep your podcasts right around what forty five minutes roughly. Yeah, roughly, uh-huh. <laughs> And this podcast was over two hours long, and I, I looked in 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 her roster there of, and she's all over two hours a lot, and and then she was asking her producer or whoever her co host or whatever saying. Um, what are people saying in the comments? Cause apparently they must do a podcast and, and like a, um, a YouTube thing simultaneously or whatever. Mm-hmm. So what are they saying in the comments? And they say, they love your questions. They love how you draw this out of your things, but, and they all listen to you and they love you and they want to stick with you. But they said, please, please, when you ask a question, let them answer. <laughs> because she's so busy jumping in to say, well, this or this, you know, or explain something on top of it. And they said, just let your talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow. Yeah. And, and I thought it was great how she was, she was inviting this feedback in because she wants to be better. She's been doing her podcast about a year and she mm-hmm. wants to be better at it. And she's just like, oh, wow. Oh. She even swore a couple of times like, ooh, that, 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 she's OK, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better at that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the whole point, it's not supposed to be one sided in most of these conversations. It's, that's why it's called a conversation. I know um, there are certain situations where it is an interview specifically. And mm-hmm. the, the goal is to learn more about the person you're interviewing um, but the goal of some of our conversations is more about uh, developing understanding around a topic. So, right. Um, right. yeah. But the other aspect of this that kind of threw me was this whole comparison and this desire to compare one tragedy to another rather than mm-hmm. recognizing that each tragedy is its own thing and that mm-hmm. um, to, to compare is kind of ridiculous um, only because I bet if you wrote a letter to the person who did this four episode series on the Chicago fire and said, you know, it'd be really cool to do a series on this fire that happened at the same time, just 250 miles of Chicago fire. That would be really cool. I bet that person would be like, Oh, I didn't even know about that. That's so cool. I mean, you just never know what the motivation was for this person to do the Chicago fire as opposed to some other tragedy at the same time well you know when, when i started reading the comments because you know how i get about my writing and stuff i'm i'm, I'm too self-conscious about it because i i submitted that uh whatever night it was this week tuesday or wednesday night whatever and and i really i thought geez was i reaching too hard to bring the pesh to go angle in and you know is that really you know and and then i woke up and the next day and i thought geez i kind of uh, I wish I, I wish I would have done that differently. And then I started reading the comments and then somebody like Jeff Eichler, our, our friend, Jeff Eichler, who's a really thoughtful, real good friend of ours. And he grew up in the Chicago area and he was, and he's a history, he was a history teacher too. Uh-huh. He, did, he, yeah. he wasn't aware of the Peshtigo fire. And then I thought, holy cow, 
that's, you know, um, because, you know, I'm from this area and you just assume that everybody knows about it. And, yeah. and if I was able to provide that a little illumination on a topic that people didn't know about, then, then it was kind of worth it. Oh, it was definitely worth it. And my guess, again, is if you reached out specifically, like with an email, do a little Google stalking and find out how to get in touch with the person who did the interview or did the podcast in the first place and um, see if they're interested in learning more about that and doing a whole show on that. Cause you never know. Um, and I can tell you, I live in Montana. There are very few events that have happened here that are common knowledge across the planet. I mean, sure. right. really. And even um, when there was a, the earthquake lake, <laughs> and killed a bunch of people who were camping on the side of this canyon that the the um, the dam collapsed and sent a huge tidal wave through a through a canyon that's widely wildly popular with campers and took out an entire campground killed dozens of people um, that was a big deal here and even here in Helena the capital of Montana we had two major earthquakes that then set off fires, of course, and collapsed basically two thirds of our downtown buildings that were all built in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. And to this day, if you walk downtown in Helena, you're actually walking on the walking mall on what would have been the second story of the buildings, because rather than dig everything out, all the, the materials that had collapsed, they just built on top of it. So that was really interesting. When I started coming here and seeing the history of this little town, there's a lot that the country misses in the smaller urban, non-urban rural areas. So to me, so here's, here's the point, I guess, part of what was kind of what I was toying in my head with that I wanted to discuss with you is this whole idea of this comparison and I, I, I come back to this thing that this hyperbole of the best of something. And I think about this a lot. It's okay. I can hear the dog in the background. I love that. I, I love Oliver. So our listeners can love Oliver too. And maybe I'll even include a picture in the blog. His, post. his, his friend Vince is just outside running around. So he's, he's dying right now that Vince is out there and he's not. So. I want to go play with Vince. Uh, <laughs> Oliver, he's a golden retriever, right? Nope, he, you know, he's a lab, he's a lab. a lab retriever, but he's, he looks that color of a, of a golden. Yeah, he's that golden color, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll include a picture of him on the blog post. Oh, I've got, I've got right. plenty. Let me know if you need any. <laughs> oh, I know. I see them all the time. Anyway, back to this thing of this comparison. I think that it starts small um, when somebody says, oh, this is the best tea I've ever had. Or this is like just the other night, I had delicious curry near Salt Lake City. And it's hard to find Thai food around here in Montana, <laughs> especially good Thai food. I mean, you can get dumbed down Americanized Thai food. But we went to this great Thai restaurant. Um, it was very quiet inside. We felt safe, we wore masks to the table. But it was really good curry. It was this golden curry with um, zucchini and carrots and chicken and really delicious. And I, the word almost passed through my lips. This is the best curry. And then I was like, <laughs> no, it's not. This is really good curry. And um, I think about this hyperbole a lot. My mm -hmm. mom does this a lot. She'll, she'll um, discover a new kind of hairbrush. She'll be like, mm -hmm. this is the best hairbrush ever. And then she wants to get one for her daughters and get one, for, you know, because it's the best hairbrush ever. And um, she could be you, a spokesperson for any number of products. Huh? Yes, yes. She's the maven <laughs> of the, the Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. My mom is the maven. She always has to find the best of something and then share what she discovered. And I love that about her. I just have come to this conclusion that there's no such thing as the best. Um, I, I even hear people talk about their best friend. And I've kind of stopped using that phrase because I don't have a best friend. Mm -hmm. very dear friends that I'm close to in such different ways. And your article, for some reason, brought this whole idea of hyperbole back to me because we're suffering so much 
with this hyperbole comparison across nations and across states. Right. Montana is the best, the last best place. That's our <laughs> catchphrase, the last best place. And, you know, you hear people talk about, you know, America being the best, the U.S. is the best. And all of that hyperbole just starts to grate on me because you're not acknowledging the beauty of each individual thing that you're right. experiencing. And and see, uh, you know, I think I, in one of my, one of my first uh posts I, for um, Biz Catalyst 360, I think I said my, I cut my teeth in writing on compare and contrast stories. Those are kind of the ones that stuck with me as, as um, look at this one thing and then compare it to the other thing. And I always do it from the standpoint of trying to see the, the best of each and that maybe that, you know, we don't have to say that one is better than the other, but here's how they're similar or here's, here's how they're, you know, slightly unique from one another. And um, so that's, that's kind of where I come from. And, you know, there's also, you're never going to, you know, I've spent my entire life in the state of Wisconsin and I always see, see the need to stick up for it and wave the flag for it whenever I can. And, um, that there was a, the, so there was that element in it when I was when I was writing the story, just from the st- the standpoint of, well, Chicago, yeah, you you had a fire, but we had a real fire, and <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't about that. It was it was a, a a great historical summary of a really huge important event in uh, American history, and it was. It was that. It didn't have to be any more than that. Right. And it did impact American history across the board. It wasn't just Chicago that it impacted. I mean, it it slowed down um, travel and transport across the country for months. And then after, shortly after that, I think probably by the 1880s, they, you know, they were looking at different modes of construction because, um, you know, 1871, they had, they had the great fire. Well, by 1874, they had kind of cut back on, on their restrictions regarding, you know, wood frame buildings and they had built a lot more wood stuff and they had another big fire. Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, by the 1880s, they were starting to build, you know, what we now call skyscrapers at that time. They were just, you know, they learned that they could go higher with, with the, uh, iron structures because you know the masonry is so heavy and you're not able to to go as high with those so it did it did create a kind of a a revolution in in the building industry and it started in chicago because because of that fear of of fire exactly exactly and um our our little earthquake that killed a lot of people here in helena montana didn't impact anyone outside of Helena, Montana, except for, you know, the family members that lost family members from the East coast. And because there were a lot of people here from the East coast, but if, if I can play just another stanza on the comparison song, (laughs) (laughs) have you ever heard of the, uh, the Iroquois theater in Chicago? I have heard of that. Yeah. Well, that was in, I believe, I want to say 1901 or 1903, somewhere in the early 20th century. It was a it was a brand new theater. It was about a month old, and um, they they called it fireproof and everything like that. They only had one entrance exit, and a fire started because of some kind of uh, some kind of lighting issue. The fire started. It burned down. It held over two thousand people. Six hundred people died in that fire, and it's wow. not that's twice as many as died in the in the Great Chicago Fire, but it's not nearly as well known as the great Chicago fire is you now. Because again, it didn't really yeah. impact the economy <laughs> in any right. way. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, that seems to be a big meaningful thing for, for history is did it affect the economy? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but so there was another big one in uh, Richmond, Virginia around that time where a theater burned down and um, Edgar Allan Poe's adopted mother, I think 
or maybe it was actually his mother that was killed in that fire because she was an actress in that theater. Oh, okay. So yeah, those things happened all over the country, uh, all over the world, and um, they're tragic. And they're they can be such wonderful stories just on their own. I also um, I don't want to say that being proud of where you come from is that there's anything wrong with that. As a matter of fact, when I had dinner with a couple of friends in the Berkeley area last year, um, it was February before everything shut down, uh, I was sitting at this dinner table and I was talking about Montana and the hiking I do and how beautiful it is. And one of the women at the table said, you're really proud of Montana, aren't you? And I had to hesitate for a moment because it wasn't said in a really nice way. Oh, okay. Yep. It was kind of a criticism. Like you're, you're, hung, you're really hung up on Montana, aren't you? Yeah, it was kind of a criticism <laughs> I could tell in her voice. And I looked at her and I realized, yes, I really am. <laughs> but I, I never would say it's the best place. Because <laughs> right. yeah. I've, I've lived in Colorado and Colorado is spectacular. And I've lived yeah. in the LA area and I've spent a lot of time in San Francisco and in France and yep. in Italy. I would never in a million years think that one place was any better yeah. than another. Right. But I am proud to live here, which is why when you talk about Wisconsin with that pride in your voice, I think that's beautiful. I think there's um, there's something really special about that because so many people are disconnected from from where they are. They're disconnected from their environment and the people in their lives and their communities. And so hearing your love for it, I, I love I love to hear that. Well, like uh, just like Shelly Brown, she spent a lot of her time uh, in Chicago and she doesn't live in Chicago now, but she will forever be singing the praises of Chicago because she loved living there. She loved everything about the city. And, you know, we are we're the product of, you know, where of either the people we've spent time with or the places that we've lived. And so that becomes a lot of our our storytelling becomes a lot of our. Um, it just becomes ingrained in us. I will Where, say those. Right. I will say this though, Sarah, that Wisconsin has the nicest people ever. <laughs> <laughs> the nicest people ever. <laughs> well, that's been my experience, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're all about letting you know about it. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it's cheese. And that's all I think of when I think of Wisconsin is yeah, yeah, that's, fresh that's, cheese curds that you brought to me when we yep. had our conference in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> I brought cheese from Wisconsin. <laughs> so fresh they that. squeaked in my teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I still can picture uh, the, the uh, guy at at TSA opening up my bag and then there's like, I don't know, seven bags of cheese curds in there and the look on his face. <laughs> well, that was the Denver one, right? That was- Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, Denver yeah, he, one, yeah. He brought so many bags of cheese curds, <laughs> which was fine because we had driven down from Montana down to Denver from Helena. So I had a place to store it to, and bring it home with me that year. Um, yeah, yeah, well, there's, and, there's pride of place. Mm -hmm. I love pride of place. And um, that is not the same thing as saying this is the best place. The best, right. You know, here I am in my, my 60s and I've never lived anywhere else. So, you know, it's, you know, you get that ingrained, you know, with with your surroundings and and you it's so much a part of, of who I am. And, you know, but, you know, I've lived in, in this particular area all, all of my life, except for the, the two years when I um, was in, in Madison uh, at the university. And, and my sister, I always tell this story, my sister lived in our hometown where we grew up. And then at, right after she got married for about, I don't know, five, six, maybe 10 years, she lived in the town right next to us. And then and after that, she bought a house and back in our, back in our hometown. And sometimes I will tease her that I said, oh, Deb, you're such a woman of the world because you've lived in Kimberly and Combined Locks. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, well, um, I, I think it is important to acknowledge that where we grow up and where we develop our, our memories 
and the stories of our identity are a big part of our identity. Mm -hmm. And um, I would never want to dismiss that as an important mm -hmm. aspect. Um, and, and so I get it when you're hearing all about this fire in Chicago and you know the history of something that was that killed far more people just north of there. I get that sense of um, injustice, I guess, that there's, that there's not more of a story about it. And it, it, so here's one of the things that I notice as well. I've, I've watched documentaries sometimes, particularly about music and eras in music. And I watched the Laurel Canyon, I can't remember what it was called, but it was all about Laurel Canyon and mm -hmm. Bob Dylan and um, all the, the people that were in Laurel Canyon, I think in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there was not, they, they kept referring to how these people changed the face of music and how they did this and how they did that. Just so much hyperbole. Mm -hmm. about the impact of their music, these particular musicians and their impact when they didn't mention, uh, they, they didn't mention B.B. King and they didn't mention um, some, some of the bigger names in soul that had Duke Ellington implications and, on rock yeah. and roll. Duke Ellington yeah. and um, Chuck Berry and James Brown. Like they didn't oh. min mention James Brown and he was around at the same time as these musicians were. And they didn't mention any of these people of color or any of the Latino musicians that were coming up through the ranks in LA and putting their take on things. Frankie Valli and the, the people who were um, writing music that then white musicians were taking and making popular. Um, like there was no mention of those people. It was all Laurel Canyon, which of course Laurel Canyon was very white. And I remember watching this and getting more and more aggravated. Mm -hmm. And then to, to bring in these other influences would take the, the whole story in a completely different direction mm -hmm. than what the intention was. And they only had two hours. Right. Right. So they were talking about the musicians of Laurel Canyon and um, I still get annoyed by it because of the hyperbole, not because mm -hmm. of the focus on these particular musicians, but because of the hyperbole they use about their their influence on music without recognizing so many influences that were before them or and even sir, at the same time. And sir, you know, you brought up a good point about if I would reach out to um, Lindsey Graham not the senator. <laughs> he's the, <laughs> right. he's, the, he's he was the the narrator and the producer of this um, this podcast, and you know he might come back to me and saying, "Hey, I knew all about Peshtigo, but there's another three hours there, and I I wanted to focus on on the Chicago Fire. There's enough there. I didn't, you know, and who knows? I mean, because you know from doing a podcast, or anybody who does anything creative, there's probably twice or three times or however much stuff that doesn't make it into the finished piece. You right. edit and you take things out and it's like, well, that would be fun to talk about, but you know, I'm already at 1500 words, whatever, you know? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And we have such short attention spans, right? Uh, just across exactly. the board. So I wonder if I, I'm just thinking of answers, like how do we, how do we find a solution around this? And maybe because we have this access, like there's always a blog post associated with my podcast where I add additional details or I add links so that people can find more information. So maybe that's the answer in, in the context of that particular show that you're listening to, to be able to say, by the way, there's another fire just 250 miles north of here. If you want more information, here's a book. Right. And because the reason I would include that is simply because having the context of what else was going on around the country, particularly that close, I think adds a different dimension to the story itself. That right. this is what was happening in Chicago. Meanwhile, you know, this is part of why things changed north of here right. and building material shifted. Just to think about the part that, as soon as our governor, uh, Lucius Fairchild, <laughs> um, as soon as he heard about the Chicago fire, he took off and he went there and he took a bunch of resources with him 
and and his wife was left to deal with the the fire in the northern part of the state. So her husband, the governor, took two things with him. He took resources and he took his authority as governor with him. And so she had to, you know, rally all this, all this stuff. You know, by the time I, you know, by the time up there, that was, you know, almost as far as it was to Chicago, you know, you know, they were definitely in a, in a relief mode and all that, but, um, you know, that story connects the two, right? That, you know, that, um, Wisconsin was left kind of with a hand tied behind its back because its governor was gone helping out on the other fire and his, and his wife did just a remarkable job of, of bringing aid and, and relief and whatever was necessary, um, to the, to the fire that was happening in Wisconsin. Wow. That see, that's why the context matters. Mm-hmm. That's why a, a mention isn't right. going to take you take your attention too far away from the Chicago fire, but mentioning it so that people will dig deeper if they're interested. I think it's really important. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise you lose the context. And as important as the story is, without some understanding of what else is going on, you can't learn from it. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I remember when anytime I took a history class, I was not a big history student. Uh, it wasn't something I enjoyed because most of the teachers I experienced were timeline history teachers, mm-hmm. not right. storyline history teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do remember finding history far more interesting when I would hear a story and then understand the context around it of, of maybe why that particular story happened what what was happening in the economy, what was happening in natural resources at that point. And I, uh, the reason I bring this up is that um, my younger son, when he was in a drama class, he had this opportunity to go to the Montana Historical Society and he and his um, classmates went through, poured through old letters from people that had written letters to people in Montana and people who had written from Montana throughout the history of the state and territory. Mm-hmm. And they read these letters, these original letters from soldiers from the Civil War, soldiers from the First World War, their family members, homesteaders, people who were really experiencing significant trauma here in Montana as a result of weather-related incidents and war. And um, our Native Americans here in Montana have a significant... um, population in that have served in the military compared to others. So these students took these letters and then they acted them out. Oh. So they would read them, one person would read them and the other might recite as if they're the one who wrote it. Hmm. And then they told the context of it, what was happening in the world at that time. And here is one soldier that had served in the um, Union Army during the Civil War and his mother or loved one was writing this letter to him about what was happening in Montana at that time. So, and it was, none of it was, we're the best. (laughs) I'm (laughs) I'm serving from Montana, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, Sarah, see, the reason that history resonates with me so much, you know, as far as the strengths thing goes, context is my number two. So yes. I am forever looking for the the threads that run through from here to here and did something here cause or affect something that was happening over there. So, you know, my mind goes to those kind of things all the time. And that's why this book was so awesome when, when, cause you know, they could not write about the Peshtigo fire without talking about the Chicago fire, because right. from the Wisconsin standpoint, the two were definitely interwoven it, it affected what what was able to be done for that and so your know, context is is so critical in in situations like that it is i'm glad you brought that up that that strengths finder talent of context <laughs> um just so our listeners know the people who have high context in their strengths need to have that full information about a story before they can make a decision about anything. They have this amazing talent at understanding how things are connected in history and predicting what might happen in the future based on that 
Um, and it's really phenomenal. If you have context in your top strengths, you're likely the resident historian for your organization. When people <laughs> say, um, well, why did we do it this way before? And they'll go, oh, Tom will know. Go ask Tom why we did it that <laughs> way before. And um, so I love that you brought that up. Thanks for saying that. And if you were, and maybe you don't remember this, but one of the things that I remember from from no longer virtual in Denver in in 2018, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2018. Yeah. Um, was, uh, I think you started at some kind of exercise and then you said, you started, oh, I know you were asking what, what not what makes us a superhero, but what's our- Our um, superpower? Superpower, right. Yeah, that would have been uh, probably Amy and Zach talking about that. No, uh, no, I, but you had started an exercise <laughs> talking about what's your superpower and, and you, I think you, you struck on me right away and I was not prepared for the question. I was like, well, I would probably, um, if you gave me enough time, I would probably- uh, know two or three or four of your backstories from, you know, because that's my thing is to find out, you know, to, to talk about something and then deconstruct it to death until I know, you know, a couple of, because, because that's, you know, and I had no knowledge of strength finders at that time. And, but that was my answer to your question is that I would want, I would, my, my superpower is finding out your backstories. I do. I, I have a vague memory of that. I do, because that would have been on the first morning before we got right. started with the first session. And mm -hmm. um, just for our listeners, we're talking about the No Longer Virtual Summit. Um, the first one was in 2017 in Atlanta. And uh, then we've had one every year since. Even last year, we met in Chicago, <laughs> speaking of Chicago. In, as um, the world was in unraveling. March, <laughs> right as the world was unraveling, and it was year four. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have year five in June here in Helena, Montana, because there was a strong request from all participants that we have um, a no longer virtual in Montana. So we, we're not sure if that's going to happen. But what we're talking about is 2018 in Denver at the Hotel Indigo, downtown Denver. And um, the first session was, I think the first session was Zach Messler and Amy Blaschka talking about messaging and clear and concise messaging. And um, I do have a vague memory of you saying that, that you, you get backstories. Yeah. And that, I, I, I purposely uncovering backstories. I intentionally harvest them because, you know, people will know a lot of times about, you know, the, the main thing that, you know, something is, is a story in the headlines or whatever. And I'm the person who will dig around. Um, I drive my wife nuts. We watch it. We watch a movie and I'm on, IMDD looking up, you know, about all about the movie, the history, whether, you know, when they made it, you know, whatever. Um, because I, that's the kind of stuff that really intrigues me. That's so cool. I love that. That's well, very cool. Sell that to her sometime. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I actually, I can't tell you how many times after a session with me doing StrengthsFinder that people have said, can my spouse take this? Because <laughs> it really does. It really does give you insight about why people do certain things and mm. how you can actually benefit from acknowledging those strengths instead of being annoyed by them. Yeah. But that's beside the point. That's not part of the topic of this conversation. <laughs> so it, tell me more about um, this comparison thing and maybe what you're doing to shift that internal message about listening to understand versus listening to respond. What, what cues are you using and, and how did you learn them? Oh, just because um, I, I want to say it was back in grade school um, uh, where we got a writing assignment and I've kind of carried it through all, you know, high school, college, you know, since to say, okay, here's something and, you know, take it. And how is it, how is it different than this? Or how are, how are they, the, how are they the same? Um, where I work, we have, um, I work for a church and then we have two campuses and we always say that we are two unique campuses, but we are united. So there, here's the things that we, kind of agree on how we do and here's how the the things that our, our downtown campus does things this way and we're going to do things out of, on our campus and so 
there's always that. And sometimes it's for most of the time, it's like a creative tension of um, how can we, how can we leverage what we do similarly to get and get better at what we do uniquely. And so that's where I've always taken the, the stand, the, uh, view of compare and contrast, you put two things alongside each other. And, um, you know, it's almost going back to like when you're in, you know, kindergarten or whatever, you know, how are these things the same? Or like on Sesame Street, <laughs> which one of these is different from the other? It's not like the other. Yeah, right. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. And so to, you know, to start, you know, training your brain to, to say, um, it, because, you know, as a culture, we, we need to ingrain that so much different, different, different isn't wrong. Different isn't, you know, you know, my, my mother-in-law, God rest her soul. Um, one of the things, if you'd put something in front of her or tell her about something, her response a lot of time was, well, that's different. <laughs> and it usually, it usually wasn't a warm and fuzzy thing to say about something that it was different right. because it was her way of insulting it without insulting it. <laughs> yeah. And, or that, you know, she might embrace it eventually, but you were going to have to sell her on it then more than what you just gave her. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's just really instructive for us. Uh, whatever we're talking about is, is try to, to um, intentionally seize on um, our similarities. You know, somehow, how can you bind, um, you know, how can you bind groups or even connect with another person by, by seizing on the things that are similar? And then, then if, if there are, you know, how can you celebrate the differences and then, you know, go back to, you know, leveraging where you're, where you're similar to improve upon areas in which you might be unique. And so, um, you know, like all things, learning how to how to embrace the compare and contrast um, doesn't have to end, as you say, in, well, this one is the best. <laughs> right. Hyperbole. It doesn't yeah. have to end in hyperbole. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but I'm I'm going to beg forgiveness on this because a lot of times when I when I talk with Kimberly Davis I always tell her you know and I think I've done it with you too you, you're the most bestest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are from Wisconsin, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I guess what I'm hearing is, and what I I like, and what I'd like our listeners to leave with is the idea that comparison doesn't have to be negative. And it doesn't have to end with something is better than another thing. And um, the compare and contrast in the context of literature or in the context of writing a paper, again, it's a, it's a matter of acknowledging the differences and the similarities. That, that's all it is. And if you right. can use the Viktor Frankl um, philosophy of taking that space between a stimulant and your response to it. And just taking that space to compare and contrast the perspective of, as Melissa Hughes would say, the cheap seats. Um, so in, in baseball or any, any arena really, if up at the very top, the nosebleed seats where you can really see the pattern of how the grass was cut. Being able to take those cheap seats when you're comparing and contrasting so that you're not associating a value with either one. I guess that's kind of what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, right. You, you, you first, you know, first you dispense with the, the thing of w we're at this to find out which is better because that's going to be a subjective thing. And you're not come to, um, you're never going to get total buy-in from anybody on something being the best, but you know, you can come down with, you know, for this situation, there might be a, a better option for somebody you know that's valuable to know but in in a lot of things it's going to be useful to know how these things you know how, how do they complement each other how are they how are they unique and um how how you know that it's useful to know about both of them i mean i would hope in the in the context of 
uh, American history. There are a few people now that know that there were two big fires um, <laughs> <laughs> during during October of 1871. And and if not, you know, well, there's there's an opportunity out there for them to learn about it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the other thing, Sarah, is like we should have. <laughs> We should have been keeping track of how many NLV names we could drop during this conversation. <laughs> We've dropped I, quite a few, haven't we? <laughs> because I know I, dro- I dropped at least three of them, I think. And then, and so, yeah, anyway. Well, it's a pretty phenomenal group yeah, that it comes is. together. It is. It's only, it, it's only a, a compliment to your ability to assemble people. Uh, the I, best, I the be best people, that. Sarah. You use some of the best people. people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I can't help it. I just, you know, I don't think it's not an intentional thing. But once I'm aware of something, I have a really hard time letting go of it. So, for instance, when Susan Rooks wrote an article years ago about a mechanic that was shooting on her. <laughs> about mm, how she, yeah. she should have had the oil change sooner and she should be looking at you know, this level or that level and she should be cleaning this or that. Mm. And it was a great article. And I started thinking about how we should on ourselves. Yeah. And I wrote this article about um, telling ourselves either either do it or don't do it, but stop shooting. Yeah. <laughs> and right. yeah. so that's a big one that's been toying around in my head, just moving around in there for at least five years. And now the best, you know, the hyperbole. That's another thing that has just kind of been grating on me for years. It never really, I never put words into, to describe why it bothered me so much. And now having your conversation and the article you wrote, this whole comparing and contrasting, um, it's really putting some uh, foundation for me into why that hyperbole bothered me so much. And ways to kind of address that by acknowledging the importance and the, the value and the the incident itself on its own. Um, exactly, and yeah. and that you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, if you're looking at two different things, you know, there, you know, having to make a choice between one or the one or the other may not even be an option. It might be worthwhile about knowing about both of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, 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 and if the, there's a learning opportunity there to take the, the best portions of each or whatever, and um, just, just learning about something else is, is an opportunity in itself to, to, to grow and, and to become a you know, better version of yourself. Mm. That is a perfect way to end this conversation. <laughs> I mean, that's like a full turnaround, full wrap up 360. <laughs> It was the Learning best, right? <laughs> it was the best. I'm going to hold on to that quote for a long time, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, you know, thrashing you with that from now on. Because, you know. <laughs> it's fine as long as you're talking about Wisconsin cheese. <laughs> well, and you, you, you can always, you're always going to, whenever you hear me say it, I want you to see the air quotes around it, right? Of course, of course. <laughs> I'm all over that. And I, I promise to take a step back when my mother says it's the best hairbrush around or that this is the best curry I've ever eaten. Yeah. Tell, so. tell her she's got to start monetizing that a little bit by by stepping up for uh, uh, being a spokesperson for something. Oh, yeah. Stuff. She could be an influencer. <laughs> there you go. A brand ambassador. Yes. <laughs> well, she'd, she'd be great at it because she's yeah. bright and enthusiastic and really, yeah. Anyway, I could go on and on about my mom. She's pretty fabulous. Yeah. But the best mom ever. <laughs> there, you, there, you, there you go. <laughs> Tom, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast episode. I, I just really appreciate your time and your sense of humor and your storytelling. And um, just for our listeners, the best way to read your work is how do they find you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Just, uh, I think there might be more than one Tom Dietzler, but um, I'm the I'm the Wisconsin Tom Dietzler. I don't know if there's any others. Um, yeah, and I'm on Biz Catalyst 360, <laughs> Tom Dietzler again, and uh, that's that's pretty much it. That's great. Well, for our listeners, I will have links for you to connect with Tom on 
uh, LinkedIn, and I'll also have the link to his column on Biz Catalyst 360, which is I'm going to mention one more NLV or uh, Dennis Patoko is the <laughs> and his wife are the brains behind Biz Catalyst 360, which is a great platform for for writers. Um, so we'll definitely link to that as well. Listeners, I highly suggest that you start watching out for what Tom writes. Um, find his articles. You will not be sorry for it. And I can tell you that in working with him to pull his stories and fine tune them for for public consumption, absolute pleasure. You, Tom. Well, th- thank you, Sarah. Um, I I think it was twenty. 20- 16 or 2017, I, I started seeing you in my feed a lot and you commenting on different things. And, um, and it, it, it grew to be, um, I think I had came around a little bit too late for the first NLV, but I went to the second one and then to the fourth one. And, and um, I truly, truly treasure our friendship and I really appreciate this opportunity to spend some time with you ladies. Wow, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Tom. All right. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. Thank you.